action plan that identifies our specific outreach commitments to the community. We will conduct quarterly public meetings at a minimum and comply with public participation provisions already specified in Chapter 6.8 of the Health and Safety Code, otherwise known as California's Superfund Law. These provisions include public noticing, fact sheets, meetings on the cleanup plan, ongoing community assessment, and an opportunity for a community advisory group, as was mentioned already by the assembly member. In addition, we are committed to using all available means, including use of electronic communications, community networking, outreach to elected officials and community groups, the news media, and other communication channels to keep residents informed and involved. To help respond quickly to community requests and needs, we will locate an office within the community where DTSC staff will answer inquiries and be available to neighbors and residents who have questions and concerns. We have already made significant progress in responding to the problems facing this community. For example, as of April 5th, 2016, DTSC has overseen the sampling of 726 pr residential properties in the communities around the Exide site. We have cleaned up or overseen the cleanup of 208 residential properties. We now have 1,112 signed access agreements that will allow us to sample additional properties. Another 500 properties have been sampled by the County of Los Angeles and we appreciate their partnership in this effort. We also appreciate the leadership of the Mayor of Los Angeles and other local officials reaching out to residents, securing access agreements, and encouraging their participation in free local blood lead testing. Our progress is posted at least weekly on our website in addition to other re reporting mechanisms. I look forward to future updates to your committee and I appreciate again the opportunity to go over this important legislation and funding commitment with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. I know Mr. Williams has a question. We'll start us off. So as I understand it and one of the reasons why we should be able to uh, support a, an amount of money at this level is not only the urgency of the situation, the impact on the community, but the fact that it is a loan. Um, my understanding of, of CERCLA, which is commonly called the, the Superfund Law, is that y you can go after the responsible parties, which are either property owner, the com company, the former company, or the transporter of the waste, or there's a fourth, and I forget who it is, um, but that you don't have to even prove intent. You just have to prove that they either transported, uh, processed, or own the property, and then we go after the, the responsible parties and pay back the loan. Is that the case? Uh, in the main, that is the case. There are a couple of key points I want to emphasize. First of all, we are not uh, we have absolutely no intention of trying to recover any costs from individual residential property owners. Uh, I want to make that absolutely clear. Uh, we will be conducting specialized testing, as I mentioned, that will allow us to conclusively identify the source of the lead we're finding at these properties. <coughs> that lead may uh, likely have come from um, the Exide facility and f former operations um, of lead smelting at the Exide facility. It may also have come from other industrial operations in the area. As you are all aware, this is a highly industrialized area and has been for many decades. So we will be looking at our records and at other available public records of uh, companies who have operated in that area and may have impacted um, the soil on these properties. Some of the contamination uh, is due to uh, lead-based paint as well. We will not be able to recover the costs of lead-based paint remediation. However, under the CERCLA law, when companies are responsible for contaminating the soil at a property, they are responsible for the costs of remediating that soil both jointly and severally. 
So any individual company who is found responsible can be held accountable for the costs of the cleanup, and we can go after each company that is found responsible for contaminating the soil. And we are very motivated to do that, given the fact that this is a loan. And, and my understanding is that it's generally in the self-interest of the responsible parties to come forward and indicate the other people who might be responsible parties, because otherwise they will have to pay for the whole enchilada. So uh, hopefully um, the, the, that this loan will be largely repaid, um, and though it will it may take years. I think that, that for me, uh, uh, especially when it, it should be the polluter that pays and, and ultimately not the taxpayer, uh, makes this eminently supportable. Mr. Obernolte. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. I'd like to ask a follow-up question, actually. So I was looking at the enabling legislation, and so the $176 million is a loan. And the <clears throat> Department of Finance may elect to forgive the loan in the event that it cannot be fully recovered from the responsible party. So I wanted to ask, uh, how much of that $176 million do you anticipate recovering from the responsible parties, and how much do you anticipate being asked for forgiveness? We are uh, entering into this with the intention of recovering all of it. Um, we will have to go through the process available to us under the law to do that. Um, we have a good track record at recovering our uh, cleanup costs. Um, as this committee, I think, is aware, over the cost, uh, the history of the department's uh, cleanup program, uh, we have spent uh, $1.9 billion in cleanup, and we have recovered over 90% of that from responsible parties. So, um, uh, or um, in the case where there is uh, no responsible party that can be identified, uh, there is a state orphan fund that has paid for a, a portion of those cleanup costs. So obviously recovering the money depends on more than just identifying the responsible parties and proving their responsibility. also depends on them having the funds to reimburse the state for that money spent. And are we convinced in this case that the responsible parties do have that money to, to repay us? Um, we believe that there are uh, insurance policies that can support the recovery of costs. Um, repayment of costs can also be scheduled over time. There are a number of mechanisms to account for the uh, responsible party's ability to pay. Um, there's a fairly um, fairly detailed process. We go through in looking at ability to pay. It's a process that uh, was originally established um, by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for the Federal Superfund Program, and we follow those procedures. Okay, uh, that's comforting. Not to put you on the spot here, but if we're pretty confident that we're going to be able to recover that money and repay the loan, why do we need the ability to forgive the loan uh, should it not be repaid? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I can tell you personally, it gives me a little bit of comfort because the idea of undertaking a $176.6 million loan makes me a little nervous. But um, I, I am absolutely determined to recover the costs from the responsible parties, and we have a very active effort underway, not just within the department, but in partnership with uh, other departments uh, in the state and with the Attorney General's office to make sure we do that. Well, I'm sure we'll all be supportive in your efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. If there's no other questions, we'll ask if there are members of the po oh, that uh, you want to make a presentation on. Ellen Roddy, Department of Finance. I have nothing to add. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak? Please come forward. If you could use the mic uh, to your right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm David Schoenbrunn. I'm here for another agenda item. But as a member of the Sierra Club, I wanted to make the committee aware that an alert went out very concerned about this legislation, including a CEQA exemption. And uh, so my understanding is Sierra Club is very concerned about that fact. Mr. Chairman, it, I realize it's uncommon, but if I might respond to that sure. to uh, reassure the Sierra Club and others, 
um, the uh, request for a CEQA exemption was removed from the bill. So there is no request for a CEQA exemption. The administration and I think others in the legislature remain open to any uh, potential for streamlining the process, but we are committed absolutely to fully implement the environmental review required under CEQA and ensure that all the public protections are in place. And, and as you know, we had a conversation uh, uh, in this hearing last week about that topic topic and uh, uh, that the idea of streamlining uh, and providing an expedited price process given the fact that these issues have existed for up to 33 years and uh, given the fact that uh, uh, this community deserves to move through this process as quickly as possible I think has a lot of merit so um, you'll have uh, uh, my cooperation certainly if uh, there's anything I can do to make that happen. Donna Seitz, representing the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. First, I would like to thank the administration, the legislative leadership, Assemblymember Santiago for their efforts in this area. This funding is critical to have the residents' homes uh, cleaned up, assessed and cleaned up. So we very much thank you for your, your time. Hi, I'm Eddie Moreno, representing Sierra Club California. Um, we are very supportive of the cleanup efforts, uh, though we have not taken an official position on the, on the legislation, uh, and we thank the author, the authors for their effort. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Andrew Antwi here today on behalf of Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. Uh, we support the action uh, being discussed here in subcommittee to appropriate funds for this purpose. We think um, it's important that residents around the area understand what their health, health risk is. And we think it's timely that the legislature put together a game plan, set the appropriations authority. I uh, understand that this is a loan, but the timeline for payback should be long enough such that residents do get some level of confidence that there's not a health risk going on. And if there's affected properties where there's children and families, then uh, we definitely support uh, early action on this. We want to play a role in local government in making sure that we do use our resources on the ground, um, even though this is a, not in Los Angeles, it's a neighboring city, and so we support that and we want to continue to work in partnership to get the information out there and to get the public's confidence and understanding about what their risks are uh, in control. So thank you. Great. I think um, I'll just add a, a quick comment since the uh, city of Los Angeles and the county uh, are represented here today, and I think that uh, a, a collaborative effort is in order on uh, uh, with the state's leadership uh, on, on this issue. The more we're on the same page, the more we can work together to expedite processes, the uh, better off uh, uh, I think we are all going to be in terms of responding to this environmental disaster. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lee. And uh, Mr. Santiago, thank you again. We are now going to move on to our, uh, that was an information only hearing, so there's no action for us to take. We are going to move on to our um, uh, planned hearing for uh, the High Speed Rail Authority. We're uh, going to begin with an update on the uh, 2016 High Speed Rail Draft Business Plan, followed by an update on system construction and then the bookend investments in Northern California and Southern California. And finally, we've reserved some uh, uh, additional time, a little bit unusual the way we're doing it uh, um, today, but uh, we've got a a couple of panels uh, that will um, uh, augment our public comment. So uh, thank you. Welcome, uh, Mr. Richard. Welcome to uh, 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 you, and feel free to proceed. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of this committee, I'm Dan Richard. I'm the chair of the California High Speed Rail Authority Board. Uh, with me is our chief executive officer, Mr. Jeff Morales. Um, I want to thank the committee for holding this hearing today uh, to explore our draft business plan. And uh, let me just also say, if I might, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to compliment your staff on a very comprehensive and I think fair, even-handed uh, analysis of the plan. You have a lot of information that is there. Uh, we'd like to both be crisp and also uh, provide um, uh, adequate time for your questions and certainly for the public that you're affording an opportunity today. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, just uh, touching on the high-level issues around our draft business plan. Um, 
and I want to talk about uh, uh, what it means in terms of the cost of the program, uh, the scope of the program, and the sequencing, uh, our reasons for why we lay out the plan the way we did, and the import of what we've, uh, of what we've put before you. Um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Morales, uh, will also talk about the construction update and, and fill in and, and certainly will respond to your questions. Uh, let me just start by reminding members of the public, something I know this committee knows very well, that this is a draft produced pursuant to statutory requirements. And uh, we are in the period right now where we're accepting comments, uh, not only from the public, but also input uh, from uh, funding partners, uh, as well as, of course, uh, members of this legislature. And there have already been uh, two hearings, one in Assembly Transportation Committee and in a joint hearing of the Senate Transportation and the Senate Budget Subcommittees. Uh, and we've gotten good input from, from all of those hearings that will factor into our development of the final plan, which will be submitted to you prior to the May 1st uh, statutory deadline. Uh, we've scheduled a board meeting in Anaheim to take public comments in Southern California. That'll be next week. And then another board meeting scheduled April 21st in San Jose, again to afford the public an opportunity to comment um, prior to our uh, submittal to you on May 1st. Uh, so I just wanted to touch for a moment on the process. Um, we believe that this draft business plan marks a critical inflection point in the development of the project. Uh, I don't need to remind any member of this committee or any member of the public that this is a large, complex, challenging undertaking. And it is an undertaking that has a lot of uncertainties associated with it, and I believe it always will. And one of the things that we've observed recently is that um, if we're doing our job correctly, we will be constantly looking ourselves and reporting to you and to the public about the ongoing risks of the project. And those will be changing and uh, evolving as we go, but we will always need to be managing our costs, we will always need to be managing our scope, we'll always need to be managing our schedule. And at every juncture along the way, we need to have an honest assessment ourselves of where those things are, and an early warning system for things that could go wrong. And we'll need to be talking about those. So to a certain extent, we live in a world where if we're doing our job right, there's always going to be somewhat of a question or a negative cast around the program because we'll be talking about those things that we need to address and we need to deal with and we need to manage. Uh, and I just uh, wanted to make that point very quickly. Uh, but we think that we've come to an important juncture here because up until this point, we've been talking about planning for the system. We've been talking about aspirations for what might happen in what order. And for the first time, we're able to lay out for you and your colleagues and the members of the public uh, a specific plan to get the first operating leg up and running and to do it in a time frame that is foreseeable and to do it in a way that meets not some but all the requirements of Prop 1A of the Bond Act that sustains and launch this uh, program. And those are the engineering standards of speed and, and time, uh, as well as the very critical financial standard that we have to show that this segment can operate without an ongoing operating subsidy. And uh, we are in a position to tell you that we can do that. Um, first, I said I wanted to mention the cost. Uh, our estimate today of the cost of the program is lower than it was prior to this business plan. And on an apples to apples uh, basis, we basically see the cost of the system having declined from about $68 billion. And that number, by the way, is denominated in fully inflated costs over the life of the program. It's, it's not a current year cost. Uh, it's a fully inflated cost of the program. Uh, it has gone from $68 billion on a like comparative basis to about $62 billion. We've taken $2 billion of that savings and increased the scope of what we're proposing to do in Southern California. So you'll see numbers that say this has gone from a proposed $68 billion to $64. It's really $68 to $62 plus $2 billion added back in to enhance the service in Southern California between Burbank, 
Los Angeles Union Station, and Anaheim. And uh, my colleague, Mr. Morales, is going to focus on the critical importance of that corridor uh, for the entire Southland, uh, including the Inland Empire. Uh, and we are looking at upscoping that piece. So there is a reduction uh, in the cost of the program. In terms of the scope, I think it's well understood by everybody now that we are proposing a different sequence. And I want to use that word deliberately because when we first came out with this, uh, there, were very, there were very great concerns, especially uh, articulated from Southern California leaders, that somehow we were abandoning the South and turning around and heading uh, to connect from the Central Valley to San Jose and the Silicon Valley. And uh, I want to make it clear that uh, our job is to build the 520-mile Phase One project from downtown San Francisco to L.A. and Anaheim, and then ultimately to position ourselves to complete Phase Two to connect San Diego and to Sacramento. We're not cutting off anybody. We're not leaving anybody behind. What this business plan is about is the sequence of how we do that. And our focus was, and, and what drove us, was to look at what would get an operating segment up and running as soon as possible. And let me just say, this is a fiscal committee. There was basic math here. We looked at the available funds to us, both in hand or allocated, and they total about $20 billion. To connect the Central Valley to Los Angeles <coughs> takes about $30 billion. To connect the Central Valley to the Silicon Valley takes about $20 billion. And so our decision was, instead of just building south and hoping that we can identify additional funds later on, that it was more important to get a segment up and running that met the provisions of the Bond Act and that provided an early opportunity for the operation of high-speed uh, train service. Uh, and so our proposal is to take the basic structure that we're building in the Central Valley um, across what is basically 130 miles, but it's about 118 miles of construction, and then move from there through the Chowchilla area where we would be transitioning from north-south to east-west, over uh, across the Pacheco Pass, up through Gilroy, up into San Jose. Now, you're going to hear today from one of our key funding partners, uh, at Caltrain, where we're working closely with them on the electrification of the Caltrain corridor. And so by connecting the Silicon Valley and, and the Central Valley, we also have the first connection up into San Francisco. And so there will be the opportunity for a one-seat ride into San Francisco, albeit at lower speeds initially, just initially, between San Jose and San Francisco until further upgrades are made in that corridor. And we will talk about that. Um, that quarter can be built by 2024, it can be operated by 2025. Um, our reasons, as I said, were basically the math uh, of this uh, and what we could do with available funds, but let me put that in a positive sense. We're now in a position where we know that we can deliver this and have it operating by 2025. Let me talk quickly about um, the import of what this means. It's not just about building any segment. The Central Valley to Silicon Valley segment turns out to have several really important attributes. First, one of the things we've talked about in the past is that there is tremendous latent private sector interest in this program. As built, this system will not be a publicly operated railroad in, in our business model. It will be a privately operated railroad. Once the government lays down the basic infrastructure for the first piece, the private sector has an opportunity to see what the ridership and revenue picture looks like. And what they have told us is that in the absence of our ability or public policy desire to provide any kind of floor or operating subsidy, they need some ridership history. When that happens, that unlocks the private sector latent potential here. And our business model, which is described in this draft business plan, is that as the system gets up and running, we would sell a concession 
to the private sector to come in and operate. And this is a business model that's been used around the world very successfully. And I think it's a, an example of a true public-private partnership where the public dollars go in first to reduce risk. The private sector then comes in and they bring their innovation, their efficiency, uh, and their desire to enhance the service. Uh, we're very confident that that business model is the right business model. But to get there, we need to take that first step. So the first operating segment unlocks private sector dollars that then help us build out the rest of the system. And that's a, a key part of what we're, we're trying to do here. And then this connection itself is, we think, vitally important. And we've, uh, we've been meeting with people in the technology sector in Silicon Valley. Uh, they see tremendous benefit here for providing a way to balance uh, the, the terrible housing crisis they have in the Silicon Valley area where uh, homes are so uh, expensive and, and unavailable uh, with the opportunity for people to uh, live in the Central Valley and have quick connections uh, to the Silicon Valley. And we already know that people live in the Central Valley and commute to the Silicon Valley. They do it by car, they do it by ACE train, and these are multi-hour commutes each way every day. Um, if we are doing this in the right way, we can provide uh, sustainable land use approaches to connecting the Silicon Valley and Central Valley and balancing jobs, investment, and housing. So those are key elements. Let me just mention um, two other things about the draft business plan. While we are very excited about the opportunity to get service up and running from Central Valley to Silicon Valley, um, there are immediate, important, critical investments in Southern California that should be happening now. And we have been working very closely uh, since we appeared before this committee last uh, with transportation leaders in Southern California. Uh, we had already entered into a $1 billion memorandum of understanding with Southern California transportation leaders. And this legislature in 2012 appropriated $500 million from the bond Act proceeds to effectuate that MOU. And the other $500 million, we've committed to work with them, with Secretary Brian Kelly and the California Transportation Agency, to make sure that those dollars come together uh, in Southern California. And one of the things I've been saying is San Jose may see trains first, but Southern California is going to see dollars first because there's some critical grade separations and other things there that provide greater freight capacity, greater safety, uh, unlock opportunities for Metrolink to serve uh, uh, the Inland Empire, uh, and do other things in Southern California that we can talk about that are very important, and we are committed to those. Just as we are committed to the other MOU in the North, where the legislature appropriated $600 million of our bonds for the uh, Caltrain electrification program uh, that Mr. Gordon knows uh, very well. So um, we, you're going to be focusing on the bookend investments. We continue to work very closely with our transportation partners because the basic idea here is that while we talk about high-speed rail, what we believe and what this legislature has acknowledged in Senate Bill 1029 is that this is really part of a broader statewide rail modernization program that has to lift regional and local transportation systems as well as a spinal high-speed rail system. One last quick point. In order to fit the available dollars to this project scope, uh, and I know there's been some commentary on this. Um, we are basically saying that we're going to stop construction where it currently is, in, is at the limits of our fourth construction package uh, in the Shafter area uh, and turn around and go to San Jose. Um, that leaves a gap of about 22 miles down to Bakersfield. Now, uh, I know it, it's, it's popular to question the competence of people sitting in governmental agencies, but we did not wake up and decide that it was a really good idea to stop this thing in the middle of an almond orchard in Shafter. So I'd just like to say for the record that we don't believe that that's the sensible terminus uh, in the southern uh, end of this, so that you don't have to remind us that it's not. And what we've said is that it's more sensible to go to Bakersfield. 
which is an additional uh, $2 billion to connect to Bakersfield. What we have indicated in our plan is that we would like to approach the federal government over the next five to ten years to fill in a $2.9 billion uh, gap that would not only connect to Bakersfield but would further enhance the service between San Jose and San Francisco. Now, we're not foolish and we're aware of the uh, situation in Washington, but we think we're in a position to have a very different conversation now that we're talking about closing gaps, unlocking private sector dollars. And I'll just end with this. The $2.9 billion of additional investment that we'd like to really make this uh, first segment hum would generate $4.7 billion of additional ridership revenue. And so it's a very significant return on the investment. And that correspondingly translates into an equal amount of potential private sector revenue because they'd be buying the concession for the rights to, to capture that revenue. So uh, we've already had conversations with our federal funding partners in the administration. Um, they are going to work with us on this. Obviously, this will be a matter for the Congress. Uh, but we think that um, uh, we think that it's a sensible approach to talk about connecting all the way down into Bakersfield. So, lower cost. Uh, and uh, Assemblymember Patterson, when I was here last, you looked at me and you asked me a direct question about what this uh, business plan was going to say and whether our costs were going to go up. And I believe my answer to you, sir, was I expected the cost to go down, but it was going to take longer. And uh, the costs are going down. It is going to take a couple of years longer. Uh, we're, we're confident that the costs are uh, on the trajectory that they are, especially for the north. And uh, we have the opportunity now uh, to get high-speed train service up and running in California, connecting two very vital economic regions, one that needs housing balance and the other that needs investment. Uh, and with that, uh, I w again want to thank the committee for this opportunity. Welcome, Mr. Morales, and thank you for your presentation, Mr. Richard.